how the 40 minutes for this guy? In my years of 3D printing, two things always get in the way, reliability and speed. So I'm stoked to share with you my new printer, which solves those problems. G'day, I'm Cam and I love tech, but I understand that you may have never used or seen a 3D printer before. So in this video, I'm gonna go over the five main features that make this model stand out from other consumer grade machines. There are also some small quirks and issues when it comes to loading filament, auto bed leveling, and some other features of this printer. So I'll cover these in case you've already bought one of these or do buy one. Now, in case you don't know, 3D printing works by taking a 3D model, slicing it up horizontally, and then printing each layer on top of each other like a stack of pancakes until you've got a 3D object. There's a lot more intricate process, but that's a good overview. So, who is Anchor Make? Well, Anchor is a big electronics company. They've got a lot of other small companies like Eufy Security, Nebula for projectors. They make a lot of different stuff. And Anchor Make is their first 3D printing brand. Now, I backed this on Kickstarter back in May of 2022, and recently it arrived. It's here. Since I was a Kickstarter backer, I've got a bonus hot end and a couple of nozzles thrown in as stretch goals, but you'll typically find some hardware and a set of tools with some spare parts. If this is gonna be your first 3D printer, buy a paint scraper for cleaning the bed and a nylon bristle brush for cleaning the outside of the nozzle. You'll also be happy to hear that the setup of this machine is incredibly easy. With the AnchorMake M5, they cleverly use the foam packaging as a riser to lift up the Z axes, allowing you to fix the base in place with a handful of screws. You then have to plug in some USB-C cables, and yes, they're using locked USB-C cables, how cool is that? And then plug in the stepper motors, slap on the back, and power it on. And that's it, that's the entire hardware setup. Now with my old printer, the Ender 3 V2, this thing took hours to set up. It required precision with angles and putting parts in the right places, there was lots of room for human error. So not only is the Anchor Make way faster and easier to set up, it's a lot faster in general. So I figured let's have a race between my old printer and the new one. I've loaded up the same benchmarking test file so we can find out which one's quicker. The big feature here is that the M5 is a nitrous injected twin turbo beast printing at five times the speed of most 3D printers, shaving hours and even days off of print times. Give us a bench here at a fraction of the time taken to print at standard speeds. I don't think that speed will come at the cost of precision and quality because look at this spike test here on the Autodesk benchmark. It is moving so fast between each spike, dropping filament in the exact right spot. And the best part of that speed is that you can get better quality for bridging. So where it's printing on thin air, it's able to just bridge those gaps because it's moving so fast. Now you might be thinking, how big can I print on this thing? So the bed size is 235 by 235 mils up to a height of 250 millimeters. So anything that fits within that cubic size, you're able to print. Most entry level printers require you to manually twist and dial in your bed level settings. But without a perfectly flat bed, you could spend hours doing this and still not get great results. That's why you could upgrade and buy a bed leveling probe, which will go around and digitally create a mesh to adjust for any uneven surfaces. But the beautiful thing about the AnchorMake M5 is it just has this technology out the box. You just tap a button and it does the entire process for you. It takes about 10 minutes for it to probe the 7x7 mesh grid, giving us 49 points of accuracy on our auto bed leveling. So with that, you've just solved one of the biggest headaches that you will ever face with 3D printing. Well, not so far. See, I've had some issues with this auto bed leveling, with the left side being constantly read at a lower rate than the right hand side of the bed. So what I've had to figure out by myself is that this printer uses a pressure sensitive nozzle when it goes and presses against the build plate to sense the distance between the nozzle and the build plate. But it's got one heck of a dribbly nose. So at the start of the process, it does a nozzle clean at the back of the printer and then begins to do the probing. At the start, that's completely clean as it probes, but it starts to drip out filament as it goes along. That little bit of filament that's starting to drip and blob towards the end of the process is giving it false readings of a little bit of extra distance between the bed and the nozzle. So the workaround for this is that you unload filament before you run the auto bed leveling to ensure that it doesn't think that the left hand side is lower. Yo, editing cam here. I just wanna point out that the left hand side of the bed still seems to get a bit lower after multiple prints. Like I'm talking like two days of printing. I presume this is due to the Z-axis homing sequence where it drops the left hand a little bit lower than the right hand. And over time, this might be throwing it out. I'm not exactly sure why, but simply unloading the filament and rerunning the auto bed leveling gets it back to a good condition for any large size prints. Alrighty, Wi-Fi, AI, apps, 
cameras, time lapses, this thing's got heaps of little goodies. So in the phone app, you can monitor print status, so the temperature, how far it's completed, uh, as well as you can go into the camera feed and view uh, the feed there to see like how it's progressing. There is an explore tab, so you will soon be able to send prints from your phone to the printer. I presume they're gonna be a curated list that are pre-sliced by Anchor. With your PC though, since it is internet connected, you can send it jobs through the desktop slicing software from also really anywhere in the world. So you might be say on your lunch break, on your laptop, you find a file that you want, you can then just like remote in and send it off to your printer. Now I do recommend picking up a smart PowerPoint because then you can turn your printer on and off from the wall remotely. And that way it doesn't have to stay on with the fans whirring 24 seven in case you may or may not print. But also something goes wrong, you know, it's on the camera it's playing up or that it's not even responding through the phone app. For any reason, you can then just cut the power remotely as well. In a past video, you saw that I spent hours and hours setting up time lapses on my old printer, uh, whereas the M5 just comes with time lapses out the box. So that camera captures a photo every single time it prints a layer and then just slices that together to give you a nice little time lapse animation. So, so that if you get a list of videos, you can just tap on it, download it straight to your phone, and share it to social media. Really cool little feature to have time lapses. But its main feature for the camera is AI. So artificial intelligence, what does it mean for the sake of a 3D printer? The camera is monitoring for something to go wrong. Now the most common issue with 3D printing is that the print disconnects from the bed mid print. So then it starts just noodling and spraying filament everywhere. If the AI thinks it's noticed an issue with the print, it's gonna alert you on the print with a loud beep, as well as a notification on your phone. Now I have gotten a lot of false positives, mainly with black filament, because it's hard for it to recognize the black print from the black bed and decipher what's going on. And possibly when things are moving in the frame, I'm not really sure what's triggering it. But if you get a lot of false notifications and it's annoying you, you can go into the settings in the slicer, click general, and then turn off the create AI file when slicing. Now for our print, we can just hit print in the slicing software, select my printer that I named Wolf, and off it goes. Alrighty, so we know the M5 has some insane speed, auto bed leveling, and the AI, so there's a bit of smarts going on to it. What we're gonna look at now is the extrusion. So the way I like to think of 3D printing is a hot glue gun on a robot arm. So you're taking your cold glue, your cold material, pushing it with the trigger, forcing it into a hot end that heats it up, melts it down, and then squeezes it out the nozzle. Now 3D printers, you've got your cold plastic, your filament, that gets pushed in by gears with teeth into the heating element, the hot end, that melts it down and then it squeezes out the nozzle. Now when it comes to FDM or filament based printing, there are two main types of extrusion. The cheaper option is a Bowden tube where they mount the toothed gear off the side here on the gantry, pushes it through a long tube here, the Bowden tube, into the hot end to melt it down and out the nozzle. The more expensive option is what the M5 has, and this is direct extrusion. They mount the toothed gears directly above the hot end, which then forces it straight in and out the nozzle. This makes moving the filament in and out whilst printing way more responsive, resulting in higher quality prints, especially with flexible filament. So with the Bowden extrusion type, you've got a longer distance between where it's being pushed and pulled, allowing this to stretch and shrink a lot more than if it's a teeny amount, like 50 mil, so much better extrusion set up here. Now with loading the filament, it was kind of tricky to get this working. The manual says to simply feed it in the side and then push back on the top tab to pull back one of the gears of the extrusion unit. It's actually got dual drive for that direct extrusion. But I kept getting snagged. I could feel that it wasn't going all the way through. And I looked on Reddit and Discord and I found many people complaining of the same thing on those servers. So I ended up pulling it apart. I knew that if I could find and actually look at the inside of how it works, I could figure out why it was getting stuck. And what I found when I opened it up was a snapped piece of filament. It was actually when I pulled back on the lever, going off and getting caught in a little corner. So the lever has at least about eight millimeters of play here. And what I found when I put it back together and started testing is it only needs to go back about one millimeter. So just a hair amount, and then it will nicely glide through in between those teeth, allowing them to then clamp back down and grip and push the filament through. My mate Dan has a job for us to fix within his car. Ridiculously deep cup holders. If he tries to put his coffee down, he's at risk of the lid popping off since there's nothing underneath the base supporting it. So I reckon a cylinder riser is the fix here. For basic shapes like this, I like to use Tinkercad. It's web-based and free, so you can start modeling now. The cylinder took just over an hour to print and it promptly solves that problem. 
Given how fast and effortless it was, Dan asked for a second riser for the back cup holder too. For this odd shape, I took a photo with my phone, imported that into Inkscape, which is vector software like Illustrator, but free, and created a path of the shape. I then simply imported that into Tinkercad, extruded it to the depth required, and then set that off to print. And then we got an error from the filament runout sensor. There's nothing worse when you come back to print and it's run out of filament, and the nozzle is just printing around in thin air. Not only are you wasting time, but you've also just wasted the money of the plastic that is on the print bed. So when you go to load a filament up into the M5, it first passes through what we call a filament runout sensor. The moment it realizes there's no longer filament passing by, it's gonna presume that either something snapped along the way or it's just run out, it's going to pause your print. Now in the case of Dan's cup holder, I didn't have another roll of PETG on me, so I couldn't just swap out and load another one in. Thankfully though, it was high enough to be useful for a can of Coke. So it's not a complete waste there, but in my next print test, I did run out of filament again. This time I had a multi-part print and I was chewing through gray PLA, sweating knowing that I was getting close to the end of my roll. And sure enough, I got the warning on my phone saying that the filament had run out. It's so handy to have these mobile notifications to come fix up the printer. So I came in, loaded up some white PLA because I ran out of gray and continued the print. And here we can see it actually mixing those layers there of the gray into the white until it continued to build up and finish off that print job. I then ran into a bug or a glitch. See, I set off the final part of this print and I was over in the living room just next door and I heard the fans kind of change. The fans were running, but the motors stopped moving. I opened up my phone, went to the app and it said the printer was offline. I came down into the studio, walked up to it and it was frozen. It wasn't moving at all. It was just holding temp and sitting there with a blob of filament. It had an AI camera warning message on the screen, but that never pauses or stops the printing. And after about a minute, it came good and started printing again. So I manually paused it, moved the nozzle out of the way so I could then clean up the blob that had left. If I hadn't caught it though, that print would have failed. Now, I'm not saying this is the only printer that ever freezes up. Like I've had many different printers do weird stuff for me before and freeze. I've even seen industrial grade machines worth like 10 times the price of this machine just go down and just drive the nozzle into the bed, snap it off, burn it, and almost start a fire. So there's stuff out there that do worse things than that. It's just still not a great thing to see. But with my parts, I can clean them up, glue them together, and I now have a retractable Mandalorian Darksaber. How sick is this? I did accidentally snap off the end piece already, and I do think it is from where it had the bug and the glitch because it left a weakness in the layer line and it snapped off when I was trying to push it in under force. And I didn't realize that when I glued these two parts together here, although I've got no glue on the blade, the fumes during the curing process kind of affected and turned that black bit of filament white. You gotta be happy with that, that's sick. All right, mate, the ultimate test of flexible filament. This stuff is used for my speaker stands. Last year, I spent months modeling and designing flexible filament speaker stands that would absorb vibrations better than the foam risers I had did. And I kid you not, the day before I was gonna unbox the M5, Charles came into the studio and said, Cam, there's something wrong with your speaker, and it had fallen over and crushed the speaker stand. Now this one was a prototype. I was never meant to use this. The one under my right speaker is thicker, more heavy duty, and it's the one that stood the test of time. But since this one has given up on us, we're gonna print a new one with the Anchor Make M5. Now typically with flexible filaments, you print them slower than usual. This gives it time to stretch and relax within the extrusion pipeline. But with the M5 and a direct extrusion, I thought, let's just go flat out and see what we can do. So I dialed in some settings and I found that if I don't have any retraction, it's able to hop so quickly between different parts of the print that it doesn't leave much stringing at all. And dude, I am super stoked with this. This only took 17 hours to print. On my old printer, it took over three days for the exact same file and the exact same filament. That's a fraction of the time. Not only did it print faster, but the quality is better than the three day print option and the cleanup was much less. Okay, so it's been two weeks of solid printing on the M5 and I guess the main question is, do I have any regrets in buying it? And well, of my years of printing, I've like printed things like a model, like a plane, or my favorite, my magnetic megabot that can pull apart and be put back together. But these things always took time and care to get right. But when it comes to the M5, something like the speaker stand felt effortless in comparison to printing on my old printer. And I guess that's what it is. It's so reliable, easy, and fast that I know it kind of sounds corny, but your imagination becomes the limit. Through the Kickstarter, I paid $599 and the retail is $799 US dollars. It does stuff though that no other printer can in that price bracket. My old printer, the Ender 3 V2, could be had for about a third of that price stock. 
But then if you add auto bed leveling, filament runout sensor, direct extrusion, and mods, you're gonna be approaching that retail, especially with like the time and effort that comes into it. Oh, you're also not gonna get the speed. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for tinkering, but spending my time modding and fixing a printer instead of printing stuff to create what I want to actually do, I don't really have time for that anymore, and I'd rather just buy it at the box so I can just get on with what I want to make. For me, M5, easy to set up, easy to use, easy to get quality prints, that's a winning combo. So uh, thanks heaps for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it, dude. And if you like this video, thumbs it. If you loved it, sub it. I'll see you in the next one. Actually, drop a link in the comments below to your favorite 3D print, and I'll, I'll check it out.